started with the program this evening. We're really enormously grateful to all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming to, to be with us this evening for uh, what's really a, a very special occasion for us, uh, and I hope it will be a special and enjoyable occasion uh, for all of you, too. I'm Paul Saunders. Uh, I'm the executive director uh, of the Center for the National Interest. I'll be very brief uh, right now because we'll have a, a number of speakers uh, tonight. Uh, I, I did want to say that one of the reasons that this is a special evening for us is that we're giving a, a special award. And I, if you look at the program, you may see that we refer to this as the Distinguished Service Award Dinner. That's because that's the, the name uh, of our annual dinner. Uh, but tonight, uh, we're giving a, a unique and special award uh, that we haven't given before, a Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, and we're presenting that to our, our Chairman Emeritus, uh, Mr. Maurice Greenberg. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, many others will speak about Mr. Greenberg, and I'm probably the, the least qualified to try to do that. So uh, I will not do that other than to say how proud we are to have been associated with him. Uh, for so long and how grateful we are for his uh, standing with us for so many years and really helping to get this institution uh, off its feet. Uh, we're, we're very, very grateful for that. Uh, our, our first speaker tonight uh, will be uh, my close, longtime colleague and superior, uh, our, our president, uh, Dimitri Symes. Uh, who uh, I, I'm probably also not qualified to introduce, uh, but uh, of course is the founding president uh, of the Center for the National Interest, uh, appointed to that role uh, by uh, former President Richard Nixon, uh, our founder. Uh, Dimitri. have to speak a little longer because I have uh, to thank a number of people who really deserve a lot of thanks. First, of course, I want uh, to thank our honoree, without whom we would not be here, and uh, Hank, together with uh, Dr. Kissinger, uh, was at the inception of the Center for the National Interest when the two of you were consulted by former President Nixon, who was asking whether they thought that there was a need for a new foreign policy think tank. And uh, Dr. Kissinger's and Hank Greenberg's op uh, opinions, I think, essentially decided it for uh, President Nixon. Uh, both of them were very persuasive in their own intellectual way, sharing their experiences. But Hank Greenberg had another argument. He said, I will help you to make it happen. So Hank Greenberg, for better or worse, really was uh, present at the birth of this institution, and Hank, we're enormously grateful. That's one reason I will not talk much about you, because uh, when uh, you talk about somebody who helps to pay your salary, uh, how to put it delicately, it's not very meaningful. <laughs> and uh, there, will be, there will be others who will do it uh, much better than me. I will say one thing about Hank that not everybody knows. Uh, Hank uh, was uh, quite involved when he was in charge of AIG. Hank was quite involved uh, uh, in business in Russia. And that, of course, uh, was a very different period in the US-Russian relationship when helping Russia was not only politically acceptable, but quite popular. And there were very different views in Washington on what the United States could do to help Russia. And uh, there were people who uh, were supporting radical reformers, 
and the uh, program of very painful uh, uh, monetary policy and uh, less than entirely transparent privatization. And uh, that policy was supported by the Clinton administration and the slogan was, let's support the reform and the reformers. Few people know that there was a different approach which was also presented to Boris Yeltsin. That was an approach uh, developed by a group of experts uh, which was built around the New York Federal Reserve. And Hans Grimrick, of course, was the chairman. And that was the group which suggested much more what I would say business-oriented, investment-oriented approach. And also which would emphasize uh, uh, rules-based environment for foreign investment rather than a kind of privatization which was bound to be very polarizing. And uh, Yeltsin had considered both options and uh, it was a close call. And I w remember vividly how I accompanied uh, Richard Nixon to see Boris Yeltsin in Moscow. And uh, uh, Nixon was talking uh, to President Yeltsin uh, mentioning Hank Greenberg and Dwayne Andreas, who was another American business leader at the time, the names as people who really could probably bring billions of dollars to Russia if there were right circumstances for foreign investment. But that would require dialogue with the Supreme Soviet, the Russian Supreme Soviet, which Yeltsin did not particularly like. And Yeltsin made clear to use his language that he would not talk to these pygmies. And uh, as we left the room, uh, Yeltsin's foreign policy advisor said uh, to Nixon, you know, Mr. President, actually you made a, <coughs> a rather persuasive case and probably Yeltsin would consider it quite seriously, except uh, he had a call uh, yesterday from uh, President Clinton, uh, who said that this is very important to proceed with radical reform. And uh, that is what the United States would support. And that's how we would have, me, we being the United States government, how we would uh, decide uh, uh, whether we would go to the IMF and the World Bank to get funds for Russia. Hank is more than uh, uh, a business leader that everybody knows, and uh, I think that is more than established. But Hank is a real businessman st statesman who played a major role in building American relations with China and Russia, European powers, Latin America, sometimes very successfully, sometimes less so, but Hank is a real global giant far beyond his well-known business role. There are a lot of giants in this room, but I am not in a position to in introduce all of them. Uh, I will first would like to acknowledge uh, three senators who are present here, starting with Senator Pat Roberts, Senator Roberts is right here. Uh, Senator is a member of the board and we're very grateful for your role at the center. You, of course, also is our honoree, very recent honoree. Senator Ann Paul. <laughs> who is also uh, a fairly recent center honoree and we are blessed with Senator's participation in our programs and uh, in Senator's contribution to our magazine, The National Interest. And uh, Senator Sullivan, is Senator here? Senator Sullivan is not here yet, so I will not be introducing him. <laughs> uh, we have several board members, and I will mention only those who are not on the program and quite a few board members are on the program. Not on the program is our new vice chairman, Drew Gaff. Drew? <laughs> who is a very successful financier from New York and who is also co-chairman of uh, this dinner. Graham Allison from Harvard. <laughs> a new board member a major expert on international politics, and we're also uh, very glad to have Graham as a participant in our programs and a regular contributor to the national interest. Ambassador Richard Berg, former ambassador to Germany, arms control negotiator, and assistant secretary of state for European affairs. 
President Reagan's ambassador to Germany. And last but certainly not least, Grover Norquist. I am very concerned about Grover Norquist because I don't hear about Grover as much as I would like to because I want my taxes to go down. <laughs> Probably Grover will take us, tell us something reassuring that we don't know about. There are a few colleagues whom I would like to introduce, but I cannot quite do it because of the shortage of time. You already uh, have seen our executive director, Paul Saunders, who is also directing our Russian program, and uh, he's playing a key role at the center. Also, <laughs> Jacob Helbron, uh, who is the editor of the National Interest, then the magazine in the real powerhouse, and we know on reliable authority that this is one magazine which is really read by very senior levels uh, uh, in the White House uh, Department of State and Department of Defense. I had a call from a uh, uh, senior State Department official who has con uh, complained about one article uh, uh, we have published. And he thought that I would be very concerned. I didn't tell him I was delighted because it demonstrated to me that we were taken seriously. And uh, uh, last, I would want to introduce our uh, new staff member, George Bibi. George, where are you? George uh, <laughs> is our new director of uh, intelligence program, the program which we are just in the process of putting together. He was director of Russian research at the Central Intelligence Agency. He uh, also was a senior national security aide to Vice President Cheney. Uh, he also has uh, his private company dealing with cyber security. And George tells me, in terms of our collusion business, it is not quite that simple. And not quite that simple means that no. It's not like this is witch hunt and uh, nothing has happened. And it also doesn't quite mean uh, that uh, the scale of the administration involvement or Russian interference, that this is quite what uh, we sometimes are being told. And I'm uh, ending on my reference to George because this is essentially the mission of the center. The mission of the center to do and to say what others for whichever reason would not be prepared to do and to say. Uh, to demonstrate that the world is not black and white, uh, that there are shades of gray. And very important when you're thinking about foreign affairs, uh, there is all, often an, uh, an understandable temptation to do something, sometimes very good and very noble, sometimes to publish those whom you consider barbarians. But uh, what President Nixon always wanted us to consider in our work that at the end of the day, foreign policy is judged by results rather than intentions, that you have to think about unintended consequences, that you do no service to the United States if you do look and sound noble, but have no effective policy. That's a kind of an approach we at the center are trying to promote. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention again, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt all your conversations for the second or third or possibly fourth time. Uh, we would like to get started, however, with our after dinner program. If I could have your attention to the podium, please. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and thank you again uh, to, uh, to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, it, it's my pleasure in starting our after dinner program of speakers uh, to introduce uh, the, the chairman of the Center for the National Interests Board of Directors, uh, General Charles Boyd. Uh, many of you may know uh, General Boyd as a retired uh, uh, Air Force general, uh, a former deputy commander of U.S. forces in Europe, and also a very modest person who always urges me to keep it short. Uh, I, I can't, uh, however, finish without uh, saying that he was also, of course, uh, a, a prisoner of war in North Vietnam for seven years uh, and uh, a real hero. General. Nobody came here tonight to hear me, so I'm going to be pretty brief. But my task is tonight, it's a directive from the president of the organization, and that is to tell you something about two people who in turn will tell you something about our honoree. And I'm just afraid that they might not cover that as completely as I would like. And so I'm going to tell you something about our honoree first. I'm at that stage of life where I pretty much do whatever I feel like doing. <laughs> When, um, when the kids in high school up in upstate New York were thinking about who they were going to take to the junior prom or how to win the conference baseball title, what have you, Hank Greenberg was trying to figure out how he could get into the army and go fight in World War II below the legal age in which he could do so. Well, being Hank Greenberg, he figured out how to do that, and he's been figuring out how to do things uh, ever since. And so, somewhat underage, he went into the army, and the next thing you know, he's going ashore at Omaha Beach on the first wave as a teenager. And then, while still a teenager, he slogged his way across Europe with Patton and his Third Army and the First Corps, and ended up kicking down the gates of a Nazi extermination camp and freeing some of those poor souls. So he came home, got an education, finished high school, went to college, stayed in the Army Reserve, became an officer, and when his nation again went to war, he was there as he had been before in Korea, and he ended up as a company commander. Now, he did a lot of things after that that and you'll learn about some of those later on, but for my money, it was what he did then that most impresses me. So you, sir, that's my endorsement for tonight. <laughs> the first person that will then, that tell you about other dimensions of Hank Greenberg's life is, is a naval officer. That's a wonderful thing to do, to be a naval officer, unless you have an opportunity to be an Air Force officer. <laughs> 
a kid that grew up in Hollywood, a very unusual set of circumstances, I think. His father was a, a publicist and, and um, agent, whatever they call him. And I, pre I don't know this, but it wouldn't surprise me to know that when Mike showed up at the Naval Academy that he needed a haircut badly. <clears throat> but he adapted to that Naval culture he graduated in 68 and he went on and, and he did about everything one can do in that great service. Commanded everything you could imagine. Ships, individual ships, a tanker, a guided missile destroyer, a cruiser, a guided missile cruiser, organizational, organizations of ships, groups, task force, fleet, the second fleet in the Atlantic. He ended up, as far as the commander is concerned, commanding all of the naval forces in, the, in Europe, and as well as being the commander of uh, the southern flank of NATO. Um, a command, by the way, that I once served in, although at a much lower level. <clears throat> all the major staff, um, tasks that one has to do if one reaches the top of this pyramid. And then uh, vice, um, CNO, CNO, and our 17th chairman of the Joint Chiefs. These are things that you know are easily discernible. I'm going to tell you three things quickly that you won't read in the bi biographies, I don't think. I've had the opportunity at fairly, at, at an observable distance, to watch all of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, by the way, since the Carter administration. So I think I understand something about what it takes to do that and to do it well. Mike Mullen's the first guy that I know who thought seriously and spoke publicly seriously about the economic component of national security and what we cannot do without that being first and foremost and robust. And I think maybe that may have something to do with his admiration for our honoree. Number two, in a really courageous move, Mike Mullen opened the door for the possibility for a fraction of our society which had not been allowed to openly serve in our military to do so and to persuade the political apparatus to put don't ask, don't tell on the dustbin of history. The final thing, and this is hard to explain, but all general and flag officers have to operate at one degree or another at the intersection between the political and the military. And if you're going to do that successfully, uh, take some extra skill and understanding and at the very apex of the military, that's the apex of that intersection. And so you, to do so and to do it well, you have to understand the political process, the mechanism, the people in it, how that works without being, without becoming political yourself. Not so easy. And particularly difficult I would tell you, and this is inside baseball maybe, but from 1986 onward, up to that point from 1947 to 1986, the chairman could go to the president and say, <clears throat> Mr. President, I might agree with it, but I have to speak on behalf of the, this corporate entity called the JCS, and their collective wisdom is as follows. After 1986, that shield was taken away from him. He became the principal advisor to the President and Secretary of Defense, and that made him vulnerable for 
co-optation politically. And it took an extra amount of restraint and skill and to maintain that very precious non-political aspect of our military. When Mike Mullen retired, there was nobody in this city that had, could tell you whether he was a conservative or a liberal, whether he was a Republican or a Democrat, nobody knew. Nobody. And he has done that better than anybody I know. Mike, would you come up? It's your... It's hard, uh, actually, even to imagine that I would be here tonight in such distinguished company. And as I look around the room, um, there are so many people who've made a difference uh, in my life. Uh, and one of them, quite frankly, is our honoree tonight. And that's really who I'd like to talk about. Despite the fact that at one point, Chuck, I really did want to fly airplanes, uh, but like many aspiring 21-year-olds, my eyes didn't meet the test, and so I was forced to choose another path, which worked out. Um, there are uh, people who've made such a difference for me, and Chuck Boyd leads that group, and I'd only mention one area. I feel very strongly about how the military speaks out in this country in support of policy, both active, but in particular, retired. And there's nobody that taught me more about that than Chuck Boyd, that uh, we, we live at a time where there's ample opportunity for everybody to have a view on policy, and yet the retireds who speak out constantly and publicly disagreeing with policy confuse the American people and confuse our men and women in uniform. And Chuck Boyd taught me that, and I tried to live by that, Chuck, and I'm very grateful for your mentorship. But tonight really is about Hank, uh, uh, and, uh, and also Corinne. Um, um, I've got to know them, actually I first met Hank, I really through Chuck and the business executives of that support national security. And I took, at Chuck's behest, a group of them into Afghanistan in 2008, and one of the individuals who went was Hank Greenberg. And some of, there are others here tonight that were on that, tri that, were, that were on that trip. This was at a time where McChrystal had just taken over. We were actually in somewhat of a very, very difficult situation from a leadership standpoint, from a strategy standpoint, from an execution standpoint, in a very difficult country. And so that was my first exposure to Hank. I didn't really, I hadn't really focused on his business life and hadn't focused on his life. But when you're around him and you start to then study his background, uh, you are, I mean, the, actually it sort of just takes your breath away. And when Chuck asked me to speak, and I was going to be the third speaker at the time. I know I'm second. And I had a pretty good idea what I was going to talk about. And I said, well, then, Chuck, what are you going to talk about? He says, well, I'm going to talk about Hank's time in the military. And I said, well, good. That takes over about 90% of what I was going to talk about tonight. Um, but that time, what, what I remember about Hank early in 2008 uh, was his interest, his concern, his incisive questions about what our strategy was, about how critical it was, uh, and a characteristic I learned about him that is absolutely critical in my life is you don't do this from afar. If you want to know about Afghanistan and what's going on, you go and you see and you draw conclusions based on your observations and the questions. And Hank and the group had a pretty wide open opportunity. Uh, they weren't constrained on where they could go or what they could do. Uh, and I really admired that aspect 
uh, of Hank. Subsequent to that, I, I engaged Hank over time, and I'm one, really seeking his wisdom, two, under, trying to understand as much about what he knew as I possibly could. It is ironic over the course of some 70 to 80 years that we literally stand here or we sit here tonight and the countries that we're talking about are Russia and China and North Korea. Um, and those are countries that Hank Greenberg has focused on his whole life in, in different ways. From the times that Chuck talked about until very recently, uh, it really currently, uh, and it speaks volumes about the challenges that we have. I still fundamentally believe that, that we've got to get this right economically before we get it right in any other dimension or we can't get the rest correct. And what Hank did after he, after he left the military the second time was build an economic powerhouse that made a huge difference in the world and establish a relationship with a country that we all know is economically going to dominate the world here in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and he did that principally with the interests of the United States in mind. He has been engaged here in this institution because of that. He has traveled with us for years to understand the military aspect of what we're doing as well as all of the other phases, if you will, or aspects of the portfolio that have to be in place at a time when, from my perspective, it's far too easy to use the military. It's far too easy to start with the military, where the strategy becomes let's use the military and hope we get it right, and then we'll see what happens after that. And I fundamentally disagree with that in terms of how we use our military, that we need a strategy, we need policy, and we need to be part of that. And Hank Greenberg's been a big part of that discussion in my life because of his background and what he's done and because he cares so much about the country. That he cares so much about the country, what we stand for as a democracy, what we represent, what we can be, was represented by Chuck. Um, and it's hard for me to know, Hank, um, how many lives you've impacted, the difference that you've made over the course of your professional life in terms of uh, the real impact, uh, except to know that it's been enormous, it's been constant, it's been passionate. And then it goes, I also you know, go back to Corinne. You couldn't have done that with a, uh, without a lot of support, a lot of support, because you were gone a lot. You were gone a lot you know, on this mission of yours in your life. We, we uh, in the military, when we, when we look, when we, when we meet families of the fallen, those whose sons or daughters, brothers or sisters, moms or dads have paid the ultimate sacrifice for this country, the one thing they ask in many different ways, but the message comes through loud and clear and it is, please never forget our sons, daughters, and our sacrifice. Never, ever forget. I feel pretty comfortable from the, certainly the military perspective uh, and the interests of the United States that that represents, Hank. It's very easy for me to say that for those of us in the United States that have been blessed with your leadership and your passion and your impact. I promise you, we will never ever forget. God bless you and thank you. Thank you, Mike.
think one of the most difficult tasks of this kind is to try to say something in, about a man like Henry Kissinger that no one else knows. <clears throat> I had a history professor one time in a course um, in the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, and he, I remember quite a bit of what he told me, and, and uh, one of the things was that by word count, more had been written about uh, Napoleon Bonaparte than anyone in history save Jesus of Nazareth. I think if um, that history professor were around now, he might put Henry Kissinger up there. <coughs> Henry, come on up. I, I have about two more minutes, though, of what I want to say, <laughs> if that's okay. I just say one more thing that I don't think anybody here knows about Henry Kissinger, and they know everything else. If you were to take a poll of the prisoners of war who came home from Vietnam about who their favorite figures were in that war, I think the majority would say Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger was give credit where credit is due to President Nixon, but it was Henry who was in the trenches in Paris fighting with the North Vietnamese and ground out an agreement which allowed men like me to come home with dignity and with a sense that what we, we had not sacrificed for nothing. That's what we think about Henry Kissinger. He's the man got that agreement. I'll, I'll always honor him for that. So. I can't tell you how much these words mean to me because it has been my experience and of my life to serve in a period of extraordinary division in this country. And the men and women who sacrificed in Vietnam and in other conflicts did so not for the immediate issues primarily but for what America stands for in the world. I came here as a refugee, and so I know what America meant to people who were oppressed. And when I later on at Harvard and elsewhere heard about the totalitarian tendencies in America and the battles that had to be fought against the dictatorial Americans who were trying to uh, deprive us. I thought, you don't, you, uh, you don't know how lucky you are because you've never seen a totalitarian country. So that is what America has meant to the world. And the reason I mention that is because what one thing that has kept the American vision alive have been people like Hank Greenberg. He showed up in my life after I left government service I don't really know how he appeared. I've never gotten rid of him <laughs> since because he has been a man with a mission, not with speeches, but when he saw shortage, uh, suffering 
or inadequacies. He has tried to do something about them. He did so because it was his conviction of how one fulfilled oneself in this society. He did not make great speeches about abstract principles. He would look at a problem that needed fixing, whether it was a hospital or a university or a study program. Hank could always be counted on either to try to fix it himself or to find people who might fix it. The task of any leader is to take his society or to help his society to go from where it is to where it has not yet been. And in the life that I have had the privilege of sharing with Hank, America has had to go through enormous transitions. We had to go from a period in which we were economically dominant and in which we could identify leadership with overwhelming problems with resources to a world in which simultaneously upheavals are going on in every part of the world simultaneously based on different cultural precepts so that the role for America now is much more complex than it was in the original phase of my acquaintance mm -hmm. with, with Hank. And this is why Hank has put so much emphasis on this center, on the Council on Foreign Relations for a while in New York, trying to answer the question of how to adapt the purposes and means of America to a differential evolution. And to do so in a way in which we could no longer overwhelm problems with resources, but we had to think about priorities within our country and around the world. And if you look at the institutions that Hank has supported, and the individuals to whom he has given assistance mm -hmm. and the efforts he's tried to make, they have been at the critical point of our national purposes. So that's why I honor, I honor Hank. And he hasn't done so simply by contributing resources, but by being actively engaged. For a while, I was chairman of the advisory board of AIT, which meant that I was supposed to advise Hank about foreign policy. It was the easiest job I've ever had in my life because he was not in need of much uh, education. But it was exciting to travel around the world with him. And we visited China right after Tiananmen Square. And he had the wisdom to understand, one, that he would defend the American principles of government, but also that China had to become reintegrated into the international community. And as I observed, 
Hang's impact on the world. It was not primarily or because he was a great businessman, which he undoubtedly is, but because in the various countries he visited, he projected an image of commitment to their importance and to their concerns, so that all over the world there are leading people who are not any longer in business, who long after they withdrew from their economic relationships with him, considered him their friend and their counselor. And that's what all of us whose lives he, he touched have continued to think of him. To face a tremendous personal crisis that to ordinary people would look at the collapse of all they had worked for, which is what happened to Hank in 1986. And then rebuild this him, himself and demonstrate his tremendous leadership abilities and to continue all the other activities in which he had been engaged is a sign of tremendous moral strength. So uh, it is a great honor for me uh, to be here. I respect Hank for his military service. I know he's been at Omaha Beach. He's never lectured. He, you, you don't hear him speak about his adventures. Mm -hmm. I have benefited from hospitals he has endowed in New York. I've never heard him make any claims to that achievement. And I have been convinced for many years how much America needs an ability to rethink the strategy we have to pursue in the world. And we are all assembled here in a project that owes so much to Hank. And since he never gives us a chance to talk about that aspect of it, I'm very happy to be able to pay this tribute to a great American, to somebody who can help bring us together at a moment when we are so divided and give us hope that we will define a direction that will enable us to continue what America has meant to the world. Thank you very much for the public. What do you say after that? <laughs> um, Henry, thank you so much for those words. We've been good friends for a long time, but I was overwhelmed by your, by your discussion. Thank you so much. Before I go on, I want to say that without my wife, uh, these many years, I never would have achieved the things that I did. Her support 
during good times and bad times, uh, and the sacrifices that she made when I was traveling constantly um, couldn't have happened without her. So thank you very much. I'm leaving tomorrow for China. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank the other speakers very much. Uh, I've enjoyed my work with Dimitri. It goes back to when uh, President Nixon did not believe that a foreign policy institution uh, following what he believed in would succeed. Uh, we thought he was wrong. He was a great foreign policy leader. Uh, his activities in China alone uh, were, were not only dramatic, they were earth shaking and did a great deal for our country. And so Dimitri, um, carrying out the mission that we start out with uh, is all because of your efforts. And uh, the little bit that I did could not be, have d even been done without you. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Greenberg, please remain on the stage, and uh, uh, Dov Zockheim and David Zelaznik will come to present you with the award. Okay. Gentlemen, please. Um, and, and Admiral Mullen, um, I enjoyed every minute uh, when we were together, and I learned a great deal from you. And of course, uh, Chuck Boyd, uh, I've known for quite some time. Uh, we went to North Korea together. We both got out of there together. <laughs> My wife was on that trip. Yeah. <laughs> it was an eye open for her too. <laughs> so all thank, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight on um, a hot July evening in July. And that's an effort. Thank you so much for being here. short when we speak, and that's very easy. Mike Mullins said that 90% of what he had said was said by Chuck. I can say that 100% of what I was going to say has already been said, but I think the real message, and you were my chairman when I started as vice chairman, not everybody has three great men praising them the way they praised you and your wife. That kind of makes you a great man, and I am very proud that I can even be on this podium with you. Well, Hank, I had the pleasure of sitting with your wife at dinner, and she told me at 9 o'clock she is getting up and going back to New York. <laughs> so I'm going to make this very, very brief. Um, I was thinking about the fact that um, for my whole adult life, for all of our adult lives, you've been a legendary business leader. You took a relatively small company and you made it the greatest insurance company in the world. And I did a little research and I saw that since you took the company public, it went up 700-fold in value. And I thought, if you had only worked on Saturdays and Sundays, you might have done better. Uh, and I guess the other thing in terms of our lives, you've been the face of American business. I mean, you and David Rockefeller, very few peers have really represented America's interests and have excelled at presenting America in a positive way uh, abroad. And I think uh, we owe you a great debt of gratitude for that, and it's a great mo role model for uh, future generations. So on behalf of the board, it is our pleasure to congratulate you and to present you with this honor. Thank you very much. I'm very proud to receive this. It'll have a place of honor in my office. Thank you so much. Folks, there's somebody here that has not been mentioned, and I think it tells you something about this man. Secretary of Defense Bill Cohen is here with his wife, Janet. A 
great man, a great friend. He served on the AIG board for many years. And great wisdom. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, please uh, have a very good and uh, safe rest of the night. Thank you.